Verse 32, Hebrews 11, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, <clears throat> became mighty in war. Put foreign armies to fight, to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. All right, so we come to the end of chapter 11. And, and the, the plane is, is landing in this picture of the heroes of what God um, has been doing in their lives. And again, remember, this list that's given is simply a, a sampling of those people of faith. There are many more uh, that could have been written of. Um, but these were chosen for differing reasons and in God's divine economy just as simple examples. So first, I, I want you to I want to just list through the names that are listed there kind of quickly. Um, but we see flawed lives. Each of the ones mentioned have serious issues. And, and I think it's important for us to see that. We, again, as I've mentioned several times, we, we have this tendency to look back at the names of the older saints and think, well, yeah, I mean, if my life were like that, if your life were like what? I mean, if you look into the details of their lives, you will see that their lives were difficult at best, and they made some really terrible decisions along the way. There was some faithlessness in them, but God used them anyway. And for me, that is great encouragement. I love to see the humanness and the brokenness of the people listed because those are the very things I see in myself. But yet, in the midst of the humanness and the brokenness, the flawed lives that they are, we see a remarkable faith that I believe is completely instilled by God and given as a gift from God. So, um, with Gideon, I'm going to give you a key word with each of them. With Gideon, I think the word small um, is, a, is a good way to describe an understanding of Gideon. He is the, the warrior that was used... And with him, less is more. If you know the story of Gideon, he began with 32,000 troops. He ended up going to battle with 300. And they won. So God can do anything that he wants to do because he is God. Barak. With Barak, I see recognition. There were issues with Barak. He's a lesser known Person. He comes along in the time of the judges. Uh, Deborah, the judge, really is given credit for his accomplishments. And so the word I would use there is the word recognition. In fact, he really didn't need the recognition, but um, we, we read about him. He was used by God, and he led his troops to victory as well. Samson is listed. Of course, Samson is a, is a familiar character to us. We hear Samson, we think strength. But the word I want to put next to Samson is the word courage. And the, the thing about Samson that is interesting is that we know him to be sort of, he, he comes off as this sort of dense, not very smart guy who happens to be strong and used of God, and then he is manipulated 
by a woman and she finds the, the secret to his strength and cuts his hair. Well, the problem is that wasn't really the secret to his strength. God was the secret to his strength. So that in the end, it didn't matter that he had no hair and his eyes had been gouged out. He prayed and asked God one more time courageously to give him strength so that he might do God's bidding one more time and bring uh, vengeance upon the people. And God answered that prayer. And he had one final feat of strength, which cost him his life. But he was courageous in the end. He faltered along the way in many ways. But in the end, he was courageous and God used him. Next, we see Jephthah. You know how sometimes when we come to, to places in the Bible, when, we're, when we study through books of the Bible, you cannot dodge what's there. I've shared with you before, as we've been studying through books, there are many times that I wish I could dodge something, either a concept or the story of a person, because it seems so out of bounds and out of whack. Well, Jephthah is one of those people. I don't know if you know much about Jephthah. There's not much in the Bible about him. But he made a crazy vow, and that's the word I would write next to his name, vow. He made a crazy vow. He basically said, Lord, if you do this, what I'm asking, this winning this battle, this victory, then when I return home, whatever comes out of my house first, that will be sacrificed to you. He returns home, and what comes out of his house is his daughter. It's a crazy story. And he sacrificed her. You can go back and read the details. I'm not going to labor on that today. This is not the point of our message. I do want to emphasize that the story of God's unfolding grace is not neat and pretty. It's messy. And it sometimes is confusing. And it's oftentimes painful. And, and we can't begin to always fathom and understand. But it's part of the story. And it's included here for whatever purposes. I don't fully know. But God works through even the crazy. There's hope for us, right? God can work even through the crazy to accomplish his purposes. Next we see David. Of course, we know who David is, a man after God's own heart, the king. The ruddy, young shepherd boy that was spotted above all of his older, more mature, more capable, seemingly brothers. But it was David who would be the king. It was David who God's hand was placed upon. And with David, I would use the word trust to describe him. And we know a lot about David. We know lots of details about David. And, and what we know about David is while he was a man after God's own heart and remained, continued to be called that for his life, there was great sin in David's life. Great sin. So even with great sin, God is more than able to do what he needs to do, even in the lives of, of those of us who have great sin. That should never be our goal, obviously. Our, our goal should be more to be like David when he truly is a man after God's own heart, not when he's rebellious and living in sinfulness, but with David, we see trust because he continued to trust in God. Even when he was rebellious, he would come back to God. He wrote many of the beautiful psalms that we read. And, and one of those, after a time of great sinfulness, he came back to God seemingly with a broken heart and open hands, open heart, and said, Lord, renew unto me the joy of my salvation. Uh, create in me a clean heart. So he, he wanted that. He trusted in God even though he struggled in great areas of sin. And then last we see Samuel, um, used of God as a, as a faithful proclaimer of the truth. And that's the word I would use for Samuel, truth. And not everything about Samuel's life was perfect. He, he certainly was flawed like these others. But God used him and he used him over a, a significant period of time. And, and this man, Samuel, 
was a truth teller and a truth bearer. Next, I want us to see the perfect provision of God, the perfect provision. And in, uh, in the first part of verse 33, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. We, we see this unfolding work of authentic faith. This, uh, this expresses the general experience of all those listed in Hebrews 11 and, and many others. Um, So, uh, many others in the biblical record, excuse me. And so there's this understanding of authenticity in their faith. An authenticity that was grounded and true and exactly um, where it needed to be. Uh, that same authenticity can be experienced in our lives as we walk with God and, and live in obedience to His commands. Next, there was personal deliverance. We, we see the, the lions there. That's Huge, you know, and you say that you've shut the mouths of lions. And we, we know of at least four in the biblical record in relation to lions that are pretty significant. Of course, we know the stories of David, the shepherd who protected his sheep from the lions. Uh, we know of Samson who took on lions and defeated them. Um, of a lesser known man, Benaiah, who shut the mouths of lions, and then maybe the greatest lion story of all, Daniel, who was in the midst of the lions, and yet the lions didn't eat him. They didn't, didn't kill him and tear him limb from limb, though that was their normal tilt. So God literally, personally, physically does at times uh, bring personal deliverance. So there's authentic faith. Next, there's personal deliverance. And in the midst of that deliverance, is not just lions, but there's also fire. Fire is mentioned. And uh, the great story of fire, of course, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and yet they were not burned. And so an amazing story of, of God's deliverance. Of the sword, um, David, Elijah, Elisha, and on and on the list could go, those who were delivered from the astonishing blows of the sword and, and what the sword could have done to them. So we see God's hand in personal deliverance. So this provision comes through an authentic faith. It comes through personal deliverance. And then last, it comes through astounding power. Let her see astounding pa power. There's an understanding in, verse, in the last part of verse 34 and the first part of verse 35. Um, because 34 goes on to say, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, as I just mentioned. And they were made strong out of weakness. They became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. Then it goes on in verse 35, women received back their dead by resurrection. Huh? That seems a little bit out of left field. Where is that? What is that talking about? Well, there are actually a couple of stories in uh, the Old Testament that give that understanding most specifically with Elijah and then his understudy, Elisha. Um, they were both used in stories of resurrection. We don't often look at that in the Old Testament, but we see that God used them and through them brought people back to life. Um, and so we see God's empowerment through this astounding power that we see in them. Now, some of these same kinds of experiences happened in the early church. Um, we, we saw that as the church was being birthed uh, after the resurrection, but for the most part, um, we, we don't see as much of that now, but, but it does happen because God is all-powerful. So an authentic faith, personal deliverance, and astounding power. But here's the thing. We often come to the issue of faith and we will define faith sometimes as being significant if I'm kept out of trouble. I know that, that God loves me. I know that God has a good plan for me if I don't have any struggles in my life. Because that's what God wants. And, and people who do not believe in God or who maybe are outside of the faith, they will say things like, well, if there's a God, how could all this bad stuff be happening? And you could begin listing. I mean, you could just watch the news today. 
Um, you could know of, of trauma and struggle maybe within your own family, certainly within our own community. And as you go through the, the list of things, you begin to think, oh, things are so bad. So there must not be a God because we're not being delivered. Maybe these people in the Bible were delivered, but we're not delivered. But that's never the full record of biblical history. I mean, for those people, I always, I always want to say, read the book of Job. He was not delivered. He endured. He persevered. He struggled. And, and many of the saints of old did the same. History says um, that of the remaining 11 disciples after Judas's death, that they were all killed for their faith except one. He may have also been killed, but John. We believe John was, was exiled and maybe died a very old man, but imprisoned. So all of them suffered for their faith. So we should not be surprised that Christians are often called upon to suffer for the things that they believe in. We should not be surprised at all, because the Bible doesn't always teach deliverance. It oftentimes teaches perseverance. And that's the, that's the thing I, I want us to see today is the, the persevering power that Christ gives to walk with us in the midst of the struggle. We have a whole area of theology in our world today, and, and it's known as the prosperity gospel. And this so-called gospel teaches that if Jesus shows up, everything will be good. You'll have nice cars, you'll live in nice houses, you'll make lots of money, you'll be healed of all of your diseases. I just want to share with you that that could not be further from the truth. Nor is that the gospel at all. The good news is not that we make more money. The good news is not that we get healed from the diagnosis that we've received. The good news is not that our children do well. The good news is that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The good news is that Jesus gave his life on the cross so that I might live forever and be forgiven of my own brokenness. That's the good news. Don't ever confuse temporary happiness with eternal joy you'll miss it don't confuse that so with that in mind we see in verses 35 through 39 some some interesting stuff in those verses uh, after the women received back their dead by resurrection some were tortured so, so he, that is a harsh change of context. He just goes from listing all the wonderful things that happened and all the provision of God, and now he starts a new sentence. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. So they were empowered with perseverance, first of all, letter A, in persecution, in persecution. Through faith, God's children can experience triumphant perseverance, even preferring torture to compromise and release. Uh, that verse just blows my mind. And part of the reason it blows my mind is because I, I have met a man when I was in Africa a few years ago who lives that verse. He is regularly arrested. You've heard me talk about him before. He's a pastor. His wife and children have dual citizenship in Algeria and France. He only has citizenship in Algeria. And so he's not allowed to leave. They come and go, but he doesn't. And even while we were there visiting in Algeria, he was taken in by the authorities and questioned for many hours. And we finally got him on the cell phone after we had been with him the day before. And the reason he was brought in is because he was with us. He was with the Americans. There aren't a lot of Americans in Algeria. So we kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. 
And we were being followed the whole time we were there. And so he spent a whole day with us. We prayed with him. We, we met with him. We encouraged him as a young pastor. The next day, he was taken into custody. And we finally got him on the cell phone. We said, are you okay? He goes, I'm fine. He said, this is a normal thing. This is my life. What would you have me do? God's called me to do this. He said, I got to witness to the guards while I was there. That's what I do. And we were all concerned. He wasn't concerned at all. He had no concern because he said, this is what God's called me to. So God gives perseverance even in persecution. For the most part, we in the West don't have any clue as to what that means. We've, we've never been persecuted. People use the word persecution kind of flippantly, I think, in our culture when it comes to Christianity. I was really persecuted at work because they wouldn't let me talk about Jesus. I, that's not really persecution. That's just like don't talk about Jesus at work. Nobody took you off in chains and beat you for hours to the point of death. You weren't imprisoned for the last 32 years because of your faith. I mean, these, these are stories of persecution. These are real stories of persecution. And they are happening in our world today. These don't happen much in the West. I think it's coming. And I think we should not be surprised when it happens. And the good news is that we are empowered in faithfulness, in persecution, uh, through perseverance. Some, it says in, in verse 37, boy, this gets really strong. He moves from persecution to they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. So these were empowered in perseverance to death. Even to the point of death. The New Testament example that we see of that, shining example we see of that, of course, is Stephen. Stephen, one of these early deacons, I believe he was one of the early deacons, though that title is not necessarily given, but it fits. He faithfully stood for the cause of Christ and he was stoned to death. And in the midst of being stoned, he acknowledged and gave glory to God. Beautiful testimony, beautiful example um, of someone who is faithfully living for the cause of Christ. So some escaped death, but others equally faithful suffered. I remember um, when I was in my very first ministry position, I was 20 years old, and uh, God had only the year before called me into ministry. I changed my major in college. I, uh, I was an accounting major. Those of you on the leadership team find that hard to believe, but I was an accounting major, and I switched to religion, and I began to study uh, religion, and, and I, I began serving in, in my church in a real faithful way every week. I was teaching youth in, in Sunday school, and in the following year, I, I decided, you know, I, I think I should serve somewhere, so I, I created a little resume, and I, I kind of shared that around and, and gave it to some some ministers who had encouraged me and, and helped me, and through our school, there was like an office. I went to a Christian school, so we had an office to help those in Christian ministry majors find opportunities of service in the community, so they helped me, and I don't know exactly how it happened, but I got a phone call from this little church, not far from where I grew up, and um, this little church was really small. I grew up in a large church, and this church had about 50 people total, and about eight youth in the church, 6th through 12th grade, and, and they needed a, a youth director. So I, I came to work with the youth, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And so I'm there working with the youth and learning about ministry. And um, at that time, the girl that I was dating, who is now my wife, her dad got cancer, a pretty bad skin cancer. And um, I shared with the youth, the eight youth, please pray for my girlfriend's dad. He has cancer. And we don't, it's pretty serious and don't know what that's going to mean. So if you would please pray, I would appreciate it. They said yes. And their parents said yes. One boy came to me. He was about a junior in high school. He came to me and, and 
he was kind of new at our church and he had come from a different church and he looked at me and he said, well, it's obvious that your girlfriend's dad has unconfessed sin in his life and that's why he has cancer. I'd heard about people like that. I'd never met anybody like that before. And I looked at him and I said, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of us have unconfessed sin in our lives. But I don't have cancer. I said, are you, are you telling me that you are completely pure before God? And he got a little uncomfortable. I said, because I mean, if you're not, you've probably got cancer and you don't even know it. He looked at me kind of weird. He goes, well, well, I mean, it, it, it says. I go, man, you're taking that so far out of context. Cancer exists because sin is in the world. Not just because sin is in the individual who has cancer. Cancer exists. Heart disease exists. All kinds of things exist because of the brokenness of our world. And yes, we are all susceptible to receive it. But never equate one with the other because that, that moves toward that. As long as I'm faithful in doing what God tells me to do, He will bless me and make my life on earth good. Life on earth will never be good compared to life in heaven. I mean, it's like nothing. We're like wallowing in the mud and we don't even recognize it because, you know, Pigs are happy in the mud. But if they only knew how much better it could be. So even to death, even to death, um, there was this empowering of perseverance. And then last, we see in verses 37, the last part of 37 through um, 39, Um, They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Hmm. So we see that this empowering perseverance was also given not only in persecution, not only to death, but also in deprivation, in deprivation. They were deprived. Um, it says that, that they were commended through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. And I, I believe we should take note of this, this last section, this section three I'm, I'm calling empowered perseverance, because I believe that the day is coming. I believe the day is coming for the West to, to understand more fully what it means to be faithful in this kind of living. I would love to be wrong, mind you. I'm not hopeful that this will come. It just seems more and more clear as our culture moves into paganism and away from God that we're going backwards in an under, from, from a cultural standpoint, not the church, but from a cultural standpoint, we're going backwards. And we're moving away culturally from, from what used to be considered um, a positive thing even within our culture. So, why will they not receive the promise? That's a strong statement he makes there. They did not receive what was promised. Well, verse 40 answers that question. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Now, he's talking in the present tense there. He's talking to the people who are reading this. We can read it as us today. And and what he's doing is he's pointing to the cross. He's pointing to an understanding that they waited in faith to receive a future grace that had not yet come. Well, by the time of this writing and reading, and the time certainly of our reading, some 2,000 years past the cross, that answer to redemption's need has come through Jesus. And so our faith looks back. Their faith looked forward. The promise was fulfilled. It wasn't fulfilled in their lifetime. It was fulfilled later as Christ came. And the redemption of mankind was made possible by way of the cross and, and the gift that he gives through his death and his blood. And so when we, when we go through life with a sort of a, 
a desire for our lives to be happy and pain-free and convenient and all of those things. That is not a true picture of what it means to follow Christ. Better words for following Christ are words like joy. Joy is not always happiness, but it's joyful. It's, it's purposeful. It's meaningful. It's eternal. These are the kind of words that, that are right for us to use. Um, because following Christ is a, is a marathon. It's a long journey. The grace that he gives is a want time gift that comes at one moment but the understanding of that gift the utilization of that gift the the faithfulness toward that gift that's been given takes a lifetime for us to fully appreciate and then for all of eternity I think we could argue that we won't ever fully understand we will know but we won't ever fully understand because we're not God the grace and the gift and the and the love that he has given to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray. Lord, uh, give us perspective. We need your perspective. Our, our view of the world is oftentimes shallow because we first look to ourselves and our own needs. It is, we're hardwired that way. We are by nature, every single one of us in this room are by nature selfish. We want what we want, and we want it now. And so I, I just pray, God, that, that our first look would be you, not us. That our first look would be toward Jesus. Give us your perspective. Help us to see more and more, as, as in our normal view, the world as you see it, people as you see them situations as you see them our families Lord the way you see them our, our jobs and careers our health everything Lord I, I just pray that we would look through the lens of heaven at what is around us we need that kind of perspective because Lord we, we have this tendency to just take ourselves way too seriously I know that that's my tendency. And the opposite is true as well. We, we at times have a tendency, even those of us who are believers, to not take you seriously enough. And so our, our view is all messed up. Our perspective is, is wrong. So Lord, clear up our perspective. For those of us who know you, I pray that we would look with heavenly eyes to the lives that you have given us. And then, Lord, for those in the room today who are, are struggling or in doubt in some way or, or, in fact, do not have a relationship with you, maybe not even certain of their belief in you, Lord, I, I pray you would open their eyes as well to see and to believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And they, all eternity hangs in the balance on what they understand and how they will proceed. Thank you, Lord, for, for the grace that's been given to those of us who know. And I thank you in advance for the grace that will be given to those who do not yet know. I pray they would come to know. I pray it, it would happen soon. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're going to sing together. And as we do, um, you come for prayer um, or if you have a spiritual question or would like to begin a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus, it would be my great, great honor to speak with you about that. Would you stand and you come as God leads? Forever, never change. You remain the same. Mighty, faithful one, heaven's majesty. Throughout eternity, you will be faithful. faithful. Throughout history, you've shown your 
coming because we look with the wrong perspective. Uh, last night I uh, went and picked up the group that was returning from France and coming back on I-75 in the southern part of the county, just coming across the county line from uh, Miami Airport, I, I saw one of those um, illuminated signs that goes across the highway for emergency updates, amber alerts and those kinds of things and, and I saw wording that I've never seen before in my entire life. It said, drive with caution. A wrong way driver has been reported. And I was like, okay. And boy, did I lock in. You know, I was kind of driving on autopilot. There wasn't a lot of traffic. It was late at night on a Saturday night. The flight got in at like 11 o'clock, so I'm just cruising up the road. And they're all asleep in the car because they don't know what time zone they're on. And I'm just like, scanning the horizon for any headlights that are going the wrong way, right? God has a plan for us. And sometimes we're, in a sense, kind of asleep at the wheel. We're not aware that, that there's a purpose and a direction and something that God calls us to. So I, I encourage you to, to live on purpose for the cause of Christ, constantly looking and scanning to see. I'm pretty sure that for the second half of our trip back, I was a much better driver than the first half. Because faith, you see, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's how the chapter, chapter 11 began, and it ended with God has provided something better for us, Jesus, author and the perfecter of our faith. So run hard after him this week and forever. God bless you.